everybody and welcome back to prehistoric planet 2 and um yeah so sorry this is a bit late um i had a power outage so i was not able to do any recording or anything like that because there was also no internet so i wasn't able to watch the episode either so i had to catch up and i have now done so so let's go into north america and we open on this coastal setting where Alamosaurus are wandering. So this is a large titanosaur and is the largest animal in North America at this time. So Attenborough goes on to talk about how sauropods can reach a great age and that this male is about 70 years old and is reaching his end, unfortunately. Um, he's, Attenborough suggests that um, the herd is mostly comprised of his offspring, potentially, and um, yeah, his great body is slowly failing him. Yeah, this is this is kind of sad seeing the end of a sauropod, because yeah, they're just the most majestic things, and I guess to make an impact, you have to take out the most majestic thing. Um, yeah, so. With his slow breathing, he may not survive the night. And as the sun rises, the scavengers also begin to gather. And these dinosaurs are troodontids, not directly named in this scene, but are probably female pectinodon as we see the more colourful male later on. But their tiny jaws and teeth are not strong enough to pierce the skin of an Alamosaurus. That job can only be done by North America's greatest predator, Tyrannosaurus rex, a dinosaur with one of the strongest bite forces the world has ever seen, who claims the carcass from the troodontids. And he begins to feed, taking large chunks of meat at a time. And I just love watching the T-Rex eat that like that. Just it's just awesome. <laughs> Seeing such a great predator take huge chunks out of his prey. But um, take advantage of the T-Rex's bite breaking into the Alamosaurus. The, the Troodontids um, sneak of scrap as the T-Rex continues to feast. And that's just an awesome shot of the T-Rex just throwing down a large chunk. And um, yeah, he's just got this little Troodontid that sneaks a bit. But a carcass as impressive as this one will attract even more formidable scavengers. And the T-Rex turns to face a loud call. And from the sky comes a giant pterosaur. As tall as a giraffe with a dangerous beak at its disposal. This is Atlas. The T-Rex roars in intimidation. But the Catacol Atlas is one of the few creatures that does not back down in the face of a Tyrannosaurus, with others being things such as Alamosaurus, Triceratops, and Kylosaurus. And, um, are there any others? Yeah, I mean, that's a decent four. <laughs> so, um, the T Rex fiercely defends his carcass, and this is just another great shot. Like, this scene is very well choreographed. But um, he can defend his carcass from one Catacol Atlas. And the odds appear to be in the T-Rex's favour on this account. But not for long, as another, as another, as, another, as a second Catacol Atlas lands and stands with the second. The odds are now flipped and stacked against the T-Rex, as two beaks are far deadlier than just one. The Tyrannosaurus then prepares for combat, and charges one of the Catacol Atlas, in an effort to scare it off. And the confrontation ensues, with one Catacol Atlas flying on top of the carcass, having the higher ground over the T-Rex, calling furiously, and another Quetz attacks from above, stabbing with its long beak. And the T-Rex then realises that this fight is not worth the price of injury. And makes a dignified retreat, 
surrendering the carcass to the Catacol Atlas. And the Catacol Atlas then take their share of the newly opened carcass and will eat till they're full. But the Tyrannosaurus will be back once his two rivals have flown away. We then hop over to the seas of the Gulf of Mexico. So we may have just had oceans, but we return to the oceans once again for a bit more Mosasaur action. This particular Mosasaur is known as Globidens, which means globe teeth, which, it, which references its rounded teeth, and this one is waiting for its prey to rise from the depths. I do love the pattern of the Globidens too, it's very distinct from the Mosasaurus and Kai Kai Falu. Yeah, it's a very nice design. Sphenodiscus, or Tiger Ammonites, begins a rise from the deep. And these are all females heading for the shallows to lay their eggs, and using their great speed to reach the shallows in time. And, um, yeah, unfortunately for the Sphenodiscus, the Globidens is waiting for it, for them, licking his lips in anticipation. And the Mosasaur begins his attack. Where it, where it attacks and sinks several ammonites, cracking their shells with its rounded teeth, letting the air out that keeps them buoyant, and ripping at their tentacles. Ensuring the globe ends against as many as it can before the shoal escapes. I, I do like the detail that they went into, um, where they show the cracks in the ammonite, where the globe ends teeth actually bit down. Like, you can see those indentations there. And you can also see the eye of the Ammonite slowly dilate. And then the Globidens moves in for its fleshy meal. And yeah, that is... I guess that explains why we only find the shells of Ammonites. Um, but despite the carnage, several Sphenodiscus managed to escape the Globidens. And successfully enter the shallows and lay several egg sacs. Full of thousands of Ammonites. Ammonite eggs, which will eventually hatch. Then from sea to land, we arrive at a toxic lake, which has been split up by the rocky mountains that are slowly rising, and it is now cut off from nearby rivers. With minerals in the water dissolving to create a, a toxic substance. But surprisingly, the lake does not go uninhabited, as at certain times of year, Flocks of Stigineta, an extinct duck species, gather. But these birds are not the only animals here. There are also dinosaurs. And, a fan and this one is particularly called Pectinodon, a troodontid from North America that was last seen uh, in the previous scene, I suspect, as these two do have very similar characteristics. This family is led by the by the father, which has brighter colours than the supposed females from earlier. And both the Pectinodon and Stigineta are at the lake for one reason. To take advantage of the breeding season for millions upon millions of flies. The larvae of these flies filter out the lake's toxic salts and thrive in great numbers. And so this abundance creates great practice for young Pectinodon that need to learn to hunt. And the young exhibit several different strategies and it doesn't take them long to work out the best way to collect as many flies as possible. The Stigineta watch on, unaware that the adult Pectinodon has his eyes on them, a more substantial meal. And he springs his attack, leaping into the air to catch one in midair. And brings it to the ground, smashing it on the on the floor. Yeah, just making sure it's dead. <laughs> and as the stitching has to fly off, he returns to his young and presents them with a much larger meal than a flock of than a swarm of flies. Further into the Rocky Mountains, great pine forests blanket the land, and in spring, strange calls begin to echo through the forest. 
as this is the mating season for a particular inhabitant of North America. The famous three-horned triceratops, making its return from swamps and forests from the previous season. Large numbers of males and females gather in clearings where they are ready to mate and find suitable partners. Yeah, I do love how many triceratops are here and the variation between them. Like you've got all these different horns, different crest colors, frill colors, I mean. I, okay. That, that, that has to be debated somewhere. Is it a crest or is it a frill? Because, like, it, there are several other dinosaurs with crests that uh, have a similar bony structure to them. So the large males are fighting and displaying their strength. One young male in particular looks in prime condition, showing off his perfect straight one meter long horns. But the female looks at these horns in great detail and the absence of scarring shows a lack of experience and a potential weakness for her young. Which are not the genes that the females are looking for. They need strong and powerful adults. But young males are not the only ones here. As emerging from the forest, a far larger and older male with an impressive set of horns. This particular triceratops seems to be based off the Yoshi's trike specimen, which ha has the longest horns of any triceratops yet found, which leaves it debated whether it was Triceratops horridus or Prorsus, showing intermediate characteristics of the two. The young challenger begins to show off to this larger male, who with decades of experience, is not so easily intimidated by this young suitor. And with that, the two males begin their sparring, locking horns and using all their strength to try and best the other. With the weight class of four tons stacked against the younger male, and um, one well-placed shove from the larger individual breaks off one of the youngster's horn tips. And he is quickly seen off by the, by the older male. One female nearby is impressed by the old bull's prowess and the two successfully mate. But the lo loser's newly won battle scars may impress a female next spring, as Naomi does have the <laughs> the experience of losing, but at least he will be noticed as not just a showboy. And on the final scene of Prehistoric Plant 2, we venture to the Arctic Circle once again, where food is hard to come by and spring is just beginning. And the feathered Ornithomimus runs back into the show to take advantage of the new growth, but they are not the only dinosaurs on this tundra. Nanuxaurus, a smaller Tyrannosaur than Tyrannosaurus Rex, makes its return from Season 1, looking for a large and feathered fast dinosaur to basically make as the first meal of spring and so a chase begins Ch with the Ornithomimus running together and the Nanuxaurus quickly following. She creates panic on purpose to split up the herd, looking for a single target to chase, but unfortunately fails with the Ornithomimus speeding off into the distance. But with more gloomy weather beginning to come over, Nanuxaurus uses its camouflage with the dry grass to be more inconspicuous in the weather and give it a second go. And she springs a second attack and chases the Ornithomimus across the snowfield and locks onto a single target successfully. And her prey stumbles in the, in the snow, allowing her to catch up and make the final attack, successfully completing her hunt. 
She then lifts up her prize, which is not only to satisfy her hunger, but the hunger of her young family. And they all feed in this first victory for the spring. But soon enough, she will have to hunt again. And we get this little fun scene where the Nanoxaurus looks at the Ornithomaris and they turn and run away. I thought that was funny because I've seen that um, in some other uh, bits of media where <laughs> a predator looks at the prey and they immediately just run away. <laughs> that was fun. funny. And so as the young will, will grow, they will eventually be old enough to join their mother on their hunts. And with that, we end Season 2 with the Nanuxaurus, which brought something to my attention. That um, Season 1 began with the species on the promotional images, and Season 2 ends with the species on the promotional images. Both coincidentally happen to be ty Tyrannosaurs. I just thought I'd mention that. Um, and as the season has done for, the, for this whole runtime, Prehistoric Planet once again ends with um, Prehistoric Planet Uncovered. But the guidance of Susanna Maidman and Professor Paul, Paul Barrett, we learn about the uses of Triceratops' frill. Was it used for defense or display? So we first look at the defensive qualities, such as acting as a shield against attacks by Tyrannosaurs with several skulls of Triceratops, presenting different scarring where a Tyrannosaur has scraped its teeth across. And... and um, we can also see the blood vessels, which may have supported colours in their frill. But, um, yeah, that was North America, the finale of Fierce Oak Plant 2. I love this episode, personally, because that fight at the start, boy, you can't beat that. Um, and I like the season 2, it was a very good, very good season. But what did you think? Let me know in the comments below. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe if you want to see more on the channel. And until next time, I'll see you later. Bye.